if you've been watching my channel then you'll know that recently I've repaired a couple of Wren computers or at least I've repaired one fully and I'm in the process of repairing a second one and I've got it as far as getting to the welcome screen but it still won't boot from floppy drive the first one will now boot from floppy and it seems to be fully functional um, but I'm waiting for some parts for the second one um, specifically the floppy drive controller chip which has failed and this is actually a third machine that I have here for repair um, this one the actual machine itself is in extremely good cosmetic condition uh, as I say it doesn't belong to me it's somebody else's but um, the machine looks extremely good um, almost pristine in its appearance and we'll let you have a look at it when I finally get around to reassembling it um, the board itself is in reasonable condition in terms of um, uh, there's not much damage um, from the user perspective so not much has been done to this but there is the usual damage on this side due to um, the battery leaking having said that there are a lot of failed components on this board and um, I repaired the power supply on this machine powered it up and it doesn't do anything at all um, we've got the usual uh, scan lines on the CRT so I won't bother showing you that it's just the CRT lights up and it's got the scan lines the raster showing but uh, nothing else um, but the rest of the machine seems fairly dead now I've been asked in the past to show a bit more detail of the fault finding process from the start so I thought that's what I'd do for this particular machine so before we get started um, just the things that I do before really powering these up and, and getting into the electronics is I pop out all the DRAMs and test those and a number of these uh, had failed so I've replaced those and uh, all of the video RAM had failed so I've replaced that as well um, the ROMs I've programmed a couple of new ROMs I do still have the originals but um, I always test these with the same ROMs so um, I've got kind of a common uh, thing to aim for a kind of non-quantity so to speak uh, I know the floppy drive controller doesn't work but it is working well enough to allow the system to allow the Z80 to run if you take this out the Z80 will actually stop um, so it is needed for the Z80 to process uh, any data from the ROMs um, and that's as far as I've gone with fault finding on the actual devices uh, the only other work I've done on this so far is uh, to give it a good clean uh, also I popped out the um, connector for the keyboard uh, I modify these very slightly and I'll just explain why I do that if you've ever worked on one of these or something with this type of connector you're probably familiar with the problem you've got this very uh, thin flat cable that goes into it so if I just do a quick sketch if we look at this connector kind of edge on as if they were looking from the end of it uh, then we have the PCB and the pin that comes out of it is kind of this shape I'm kind of exaggerating this a little bit uh, and then the connector housing is kind of like this and it's soldered to the PCB of course so this is the metal contact and what happens is when you push the um, the flat cable in it slides down between the back plastic moulding of the connector and this sprung contact and this sprung contact kind of gets pushed down the, towards the bottom of the connector slightly and that works fine until you try and take it out and then when you try and take it out what happens is the more you pull on this cable to try and take it out this way the more this contact digs into the bottom end of uh, these contacts and what ends up happening normally is these will start to bend or not kink up or distort or tear the bottom of the connector off and it um, almost invariably if you're not careful can end up damaging this cable and or the connector so what I do is I take the connector out once you've got it out the pins if you look at the bottom of the connector where they come through the bottom so you've got the sprung contact to come through the bottom and it's bent at right angles like this and what you can do is you can straighten this out and then you can take the entire connector out of the molding and what I then do is I 
bend the end of the connector so instead of it being like this I bend it so it's rounded like this and this allows the uh, cable once you plug it in to slide back out without further damage if you don't do that just be very careful um, you'll only get three or four insertions of the cable before it's completely destroyed if you do this then um, it will last almost indefinitely and then of course what you do is you push these back in reform the lead and solder it back into the board so that's what I've done with all the machines and that's what I do with all uh, the wrens I work on as I say if you don't do that just be very careful with that um, connector it will tear the flat cable very easily the other thing I've done is I've popped the crystal out and I've fitted um, sockets onto the board I'll be using the fluke to do some testing on this board and the fluke won't really work reliably with the 12 megahertz crystal fitted to the wren so I normally put a 10 megahertz crystal in and it works fine uh, the actual sockets are just a couple of um, turn pins out of a IC dual socket and they work extremely nicely they've got a nice kind of sprung contact and they're just the right size for the crystal and uh, when I've finished and the board's all repaired then I'll take the um, connector out and I'll solder the crystal back in okay so that's what I've done so far um, the next step is to decide how to go about the repair and this kind of depends on the equipment you have and the approach you want to take as ever don't yet have schematics for this um, so it's always a bit of a pain working on a, um, a machine like this but the more you work on them uh, the more familiar you become and you, you kind of get to know your way around even without a schematic having said that a schematic would make this an order of magnitude at least uh, easier to repair so just to recap on what I've done on the previous videos I have completed the memory map for the devices so I now know uh, where all the devices are mapped into the memory space within the machine and um, on the right hand side here I've just put some notes these are just the um, addresses in the code as to where each of these is primarily being addressed that gives me somewhere to start looking uh, now I've got this I will post the um, source code or at least the, um, the decompiled listings for the two ROMs onto the uh, onto my website uh, along with this uh, there's been some questions recently over copyrights and um, whether uh, people like myself have the right to publish this information so my approach is always the same um, in that if this work isn't done these machines will all end up in a skip uh, or non-functional and that's obviously not in the best in interest of anyone including the people that uh, manufactured them it's unlikely there is any copyright um, uh, left on these but uh, if there is anyone out there that feels they have the copyright to the information that I'm presenting both on the Wren or anything else that I do then uh, please get in touch with me and um, I'll remove the content uh, or um, give you the credit for it if that's what uh, you'd prefer um, but without being able to contact the people that do on the original copyright there's not much we can do so it's a case of um, proceeding and, and hoping that everyone's happy with what we're doing or at the very least if they're not they'll contact um, me or someone to um, resolve the issue so that said um, we're not selling the information we're not selling the code we're not selling the um, uh, the ROM code I'm not putting these up for sale uh, in terms of manufacturing a duplicate uh, duplicate of these boards um, so hopefully no one's going to be offended by uh, me or anyone else doing this okay so that said uh, like I, I said I'll put the information onto my website and then anyone that wants to get involved um, please do so and the idea is to reverse engineer the code that's in these uh, two ROMs so that it will make it far easier to repair these in the future so the approach I've decided to take with this is I'll start with the fundamentals we'll see if the Z80 is running at all and uh, if the uh, Z80 is running that is if this socket is in theory functional from the system perspective then what I'll do is I'll plug the um, Fluke 9010A into it and we'll do a bit of 
um, fault finding using that. Now that we have the uh, memory map and we know what banks the various devices are in and how to switch banks, then uh, the fluke is a good thing to start with. Have tested for shorts on the rails, of course, and uh, I have um, made sure there's nothing obviously wrong that's going to do any damage to the fluke uh, or to the uh, display part of the wren. So I get the scope powered up and we'll do a, a few uh, fundamental checks on the Z80 to see if it's running and then if it is we'll get the fluke connected. Okay so I've got the scope powered up, I've got it referenced to 0 volts on the board, I've connected the uh, power extension cable from the fluke chassis and I've also got the monitor connector connected to the board as well. Uh, I want to show you the screen on the Wren, there's nothing on it, um, or nothing being displayed on it at the moment so uh, I'll point the camera at the screen if anything uh, does appear. So we'll try powering up the Wren and I know nothing particularly bad will happen, I have had this powered up as I say uh, when I did the initial testing. Um, but what I want to do now is just look at the various pins on the Z80. So if you're familiar with the Z80 then I'm sure you'll know um, the, the way to go about the very basic testing on this. So firstly we want to see if there's actually a clock trying to drive this. That's pin 6. And it should be the crystal frequency divided by 2 and it's showing 6 MHz which is correct, it's 12 MHz clock so uh, it should be 6 MHz and uh, so we are getting um, a clock. Now I've got um, ground connected over here and I don't have a, a ground lead on this probe so the signals we're seeing will look very noisy um, but if there's anything that looks particularly odd then I'll attach a ground clip and see uh, what's going on but um, it, it's just easier testing like this or at least initially. Uh, next thing I want to do is to make sure that the Z80 is not being held in reset. So that's pin 26 and that's looking fine. So if I press the reset button you can see that goes low and then after a, a short delay once I release the button it goes high. It's not cycling low so there's nothing trying to constantly reset. We'll do single shot capture make sure we're not missing anything but uh, no there's no events on the reset line so that's looking fine and the next thing we'll look at are the various control bus lines on the Z80 so if we look at the read line these are all um, active low lines by the way so this is actually not read but um, I'll just refer to them by their function so that's uh, doing something but um, don't know what at this point doesn't really matter. What I'm looking for is any stuck lines or anything that just looks like there's some contention. And the right line. That's acknowledge. And wait. And bus request. Refresh. So they look reasonably okay. As I say, we don't know if the signals on there are right, but um, they, there doesn't appear to be any contention or anything um, struggling to drive the outputs. So we'll try on the other control lines, so you don't request. What I'm doing here, by the way, is I'm, I'm pressing the reset button um, at the start of each of these tests just to see if there's any activity, because I think the Wren is going through some initial um, startup and then crashing at some point. If the keyboard was plugged in, then neither of the two keyboard um, LEDs uh, illuminates. Okay, so we're getting some brief activity on in out. Memory request. Halt. And the non maskable interrupt. interrupt. Okay, so nothing much going on there and what I'll do now is just go through all of the data lines and again I'm looking for contention or anything that just does not look right 
that's quite a low signal but um, we'll come back to that mm, that looks a bit strange I'm just feeling a bit of heat on some of these ICs so see something's not happy and then do the same thing with the address lines okay well there's a couple of odd looking signals there but nothing I can see that's likely to prevent us using the fluke so what I'll do now is I'll pop the Z80 out or we'll connect the fluke up and I'll change the crystal for a 10 megahertz crystal to make sure that the flute can run uh, reliably. Okay, so I've got the fluke connected to the REN board. I've swapped the crystal for a 10 megahertz crystal and so we'll power up the fluke and the REN and uh, do a bit of basic testing. So, power up the fluke as ever, apologies for the flickering and uh, power up the REN And what I'll do before I start is just on the off chance that this uh, machine can run at all, I'll just try running the uh, run UUT function and I'll stop it and that will just do uh, any initialization if the machine's capable of doing that at all. So we'll give it a few seconds and then I'll press stop. I don't know if that's actually doing anything at the moment, uh, as ever, nothing on the screen yet. So I'll now stop the um, processor running. And the first thing I want to do is uh, test the um, the ROMs and see if we can read from them. So what I'll do is I'll switch to the first bank. So if you recall from the previous video, what I need to do is to uh, write to port 0 the bank value I want to select and the ROMs are on banks 4 and 8. So we'll set the first one. So I'll set 4 and then we'll try reading that and if you recall we had values of 2e and 3e at those addresses uh, address 100 I should say so if we now read address 100 we've got 2e that looks to be correct and what I'll do off camera is go through a few more addresses just to make sure they're fine then I'll do a ROM check sum which reads all the addresses to make sure they're all correct that's all the addresses within the ROM space I won't do that on camera, it takes about 20 minutes to run the test, so I don't want to uh, bore you with that. Um, but what I'll do now is switch to the second ROM bank, which is 8, and then I'll try reading address 100, and we should have 3E if it's correct, and indeed we have got 3E. So the Z80 is capable of reading at least some data from the ROM. I don't know if all the address bits are working. Um, as I say, what I'll do is run through the, uh, the checksum test and see if we can access all the ROM locations on both banks. Uh, what I'll do now is switch to the uh, common RAM bank and this will enable us to test the common RAM. So that's bank zero. So we write value 0 to port 0 and what we can do is do some basic manual testing. So if we try writing to a particular address, so let's try writing to address 1000 and we'll write a value of 55 and we can now read that value back from the same address and it's coming back as 55. We'll try writing another value to the same address. We'll write the complement in terms of um, bit pattern to that address, which is AA. We'll read that back. And it is indeed reading as AA. But what we'll do is a bit more of a thorough test. Uh, the problem with a system like this is quite often these faults are uh, time related. So it might be that static tests like this work and then when you start doing more meaningful tests than uh, certain devices uh, can't keep up. So we'll start by doing uh, a short RAM test on the Fluke and we'll test it from address 0 to address uh, 1000. Press start and already it's failed on a bit test. <coughs> 
to make sure the socket's pushed all the way in and we'll try repeating the test and indeed we're getting the same thing at a particular address this is at address 01BE so I'll repeat and see if we're getting the same thing each time 011A 011A and so we're getting failures of um, the RAM test at what seems to be random addresses most likely that is a failing RAM chip or a buffer that's not uh, quite up to scratch it's not able to switch fast enough so what we can do is um, put a scope onto the various um, RAM chips and run the test again and look at the quality of the signal we're getting out of the devices that one doesn't look too bad that one looks fine as well so I'm looking at the output pin on the DRAM and this is the area of the memory it's trying to test that one doesn't look too good a very poor looking signal on that particular pin and oddly the test is getting further this time it might be because I'm loading up the pin with a scope move on to the next pin doesn't look too bad and the next again that does not look very healthy so it looks like we have some issues with the DRAMs I swapped a couple that failed uh, static testing or uh, testing in the um, DRAM tester the rest kind of passed at low speed but I suspect there are issues with them so what I'll do is I'll swap the entire set of DRAMs and then repeat this testing. It might not be the DRAMs that are at, uh, at fault, it could be the buffer that drives them and um, that again could be um, what's causing the machine to not get into the, the first part of the self-test. I'll do that off camera, I'll get these swapped and then we'll get back to this same test and see if we can get any further through it. Okay, um, what I was going to do was just replace all of the uh, DRAMs and then re run the same test but I thought what I'd do here is show you another method that's a bit more uh, targeted at specific um, uh, faults like this and one of the issues with this particular system is you have the um, DRAMs and there's also a couple of SRAMs and these do seem to be uh, fairly closely connected together and they uh, on one of the other boards there was a failure of an SRAM that took out one of the DRAMs so there's some uh, interaction there. As I say, I don't have a schematic, so I'm not sure exactly how these are wired up, but one thing you can do, um, each of these particular DRAMs is a single bit DRAM. So there are eight of them, it's an eight bit machine, so there are eight of these. And what you can do is just replace one at a time. So I've got the REN turned off, of course. But if I just replace any one of these, if we replace this one, If I now power up the REN, we can test that particular um, device in isolation, but we can also test the path of that bit through the system to make sure it's functional. So what we can do is select um, bank 0, which is the common RAM bank. So we've now got bank 0 selected. And if I now try writing a value of FF to a memory location that is occupied by the common RAM and then reading it back we should get a value that is all F's um, apart from the one bit the, the default state without the RAMs fitted is high so if you try reading this address space without any DRAMs fitted it will just always read FF what we can do now is try writing a value of 0 to somewhere in this memory space uh, so I'll start at um, address 0, so if we write to address 0, a value of 0, and then read that back, we're getting FE, which is what we'd expect, because these are all floating high, and these three bits are floating high to give us the E, um, but we're pulling down bit 3, and that's why we're seeing FE.
We'll try doing a short RAM test. It should fail straight away, giving us the same bit value. And we'll tell it to test it to address 100. And straight away, you can see it's failing with a, uh, a bit value or byte value of FE. So what we'll do is power off the REN and I'll move this to the next socket along and that should take us down to the next bit and we'll rerun the same test and see if the next bit is working. So after a bit of investigation it turns out there were a few faults, there still are some faults with this but in order to progress I need to resolve a couple of them. Uh, firstly there is uh, a broken a pin on the Z80 socket. One of the pins isn't making proper contact and uh, the pin is actually waggling about inside the socket so I need to replace this. I'll replace it with a turn pin socket and there's also a broken track on the data bus between um, one of the buffers that feed the main data bus and the uh, latch that uh, supplies data to the DRAM. So I'll track down where that is and uh, fix that and then I'll hook the um, fluke back up and we'll continue with the testing and see if we can figure out exactly what's going on. Okay so that's the socket replaced. I found the broken track, it was underneath uh, one of the ROMs. Uh, it took a bit longer than uh, I expected. Unfortunately the technique for whoever fitted the socket seemed to have been to mash all the pins over and then put way too much solder onto them it makes it very difficult to get them off um, but you can see that one of the pins uh, is broken and it wasn't uh, making contact uh, on the top uh, with the processor so i suspect that's probably one of the problems uh, i don't think um, that would have been causing the issue that we saw but uh, it wasn't allowing me to complete the test with the fluke so I'll get the fluke um, plugged back on and we'll continue with the testing. OK, I've got the fluke hooked back up and um, we can now continue the testing we started earlier. I've got just one DRAM chip fitted, so we'll do the same test we did previously. I'll select bank zero. And now I'll try writing a value to uh, address zero, which is in the uh, memory space occupied by the DRAMs. And I'll try reading that back. And we're getting a value of EB. So the reason I'm writing a value of 0 to the memory is uh, without the devices fitted all the data lines will float high and so uh, if none were fitted at all we'll just get Fs and so rather than writing a 1 value to the device, bear in mind it's a one bit um, memory chip. If we write a value of zero, then any data that is actually stored should come back as a zero. So we're getting uh, EB, it's a bit of an odd number, not quite the number I would have expected. Uh, I would have expected a value of um, FE, but um, yeah, I think there's still something amiss somewhere in this uh, setup. But I'll try moving the device to the next location and see what we get. OK, I tried running the memory tests for the uh, DRAM using the uh, method I showed earlier. Unfortunately, because there are so many failed devices on this board, the Fluke was struggling to uh, reset itself, so I was getting uh, pod timeouts and that sort of thing. Um, it's not going to damage the fluke, the fluke has got uh, protection built into it but it does mean that it's very time consuming to try and carry out this sort of testing. So what I really need to do is try and get the board working to the point where the fluke becomes more useful so it doesn't need to run to a certain extent for the fluke to be uh, optimal for this type of work. Now, one of the issues with the REN, uh, and as I say, I don't have a schematic for this. This has just been looking around uh, these machines, and I have spent a, a lot of time now working on the RENs. And one of the problems with the REN is they, it's quite a nice design in terms of it's very advanced, but there were some design decisions made that weren't the best. 
Now, one of those was the use of uh, 7.4 LS244 line drivers to drive um, data onto the data bus. So the uh, 244s were situated between certain devices such as the memory chips and the data bus. Now, they'll work, but the problem with the 244 is really they were designed as uh, Schmidt trigger line drivers, high speed line drivers. So they have potentially very high peak current outputs, and especially if you short circuit them, they can provide maybe as much as 200 milliamps per pin. And when you get several of them all fighting for the same um, data line, then obviously something's going to give and normally um, a device somewhere will fail. And that's why things like DRAMs tend to fail on boards like this because what can happen is depending on what goes wrong on the board and sometimes it's just a, a glitch or a power issue uh, can put the board into a bit of an unknown state and then the firmware is not running properly and it can result in more than one device trying to connect to the data bus at the same time uh, or it can result in uh, the 244s fighting with the DRAMs and the DRAM will lose. Uh, that can also uh, persist because there's no real watchdog timer as such on this board once it goes into that state it never resets itself until the operator turns the machine off and uh, that can obviously be left for quite a long time and usually something will fail on the board. So that's, I think, what's uh, happened with some of the components. I've definitely got some buffers that have failed on this machine. And I thought I'd show a technique I normally use for dealing with this. So I've got as far with this board now as dealing with some issues with uh, getting the processor to run and properly access some of the buffers. Uh, and now it's doing that, what I need to do is to try to track down any buffers that have failed. The glue logic is, a, is kind of a separate thing, that's the next step after we've dealt with the, uh, the major buffer issues, but we need to get the system able to put data onto and read data from the address and data bus first, otherwise we can't really do anything in terms of sensible testing. So that's the next step. There's various ways we can go about doing this, depending on what equipment you have. You can just use a scope. A thermal camera might pick up some of the overheating. The problem is the overheating ones may be overheating because they're fighting with another one and it doesn't necessarily indicate which one's uh, causing the problem. If there's a, a device with a dead short, it might not be getting warm at all. Uh, so one thing uh, I tend to do is break out the logic analyzer. Uh, which is this, so this is a logic comparator and uh, this just clips onto uh, devices on the board uh, it takes module cards and uh, when you put a module card in you put the module card in that's configured and contains the device you want to compare and uh, what it does is it shows if the uh, reference device is behaving differently from the device that you're comparing it with and obviously if there is a difference and you know this is a good device in the comparator then you know the device on the board is faulty. So you can do this. Uh, one method I thought I'd show because it's a lot clearer and I'm trying to make a video of course so I wanted to make this uh, a bit clearer, a bit more interesting is you can use uh, the, an actual logic analyzer to do the same thing. So what I've done here as you can see I've got the logic analyzer hooked up I'm tapping off the uh, main clock for the Z80 uh, but otherwise all the connections go to a single 20-pin uh, uh, test clip and I can just clip that onto the various buffer ICs. So what I'll do now is move the camera so you can see the logic analyzer screen and then I'll explain how I've got this configured and what testing I'm doing with this. Okay, so when I want to test something like a 7.4 series uh, buffer, such as a, an LS244, if we look at the spec sheet for the LS244, we can see that it really consists of two banks of uh, buffer devices with a control input for each of those two banks. So what I want to do is to compare the inputs to the buffers with the outputs for both banks, 
and be able to trigger on when these particular banks are enabled, which is obviously by looking at the two controlled inputs. So what I do is, for most common 7.4 series devices that I want to test, I've got uh, a configuration already built into the, or programmed into the um, analyzer. So as you can see, I have lots of different types that enable me to very quickly set this up to test various devices. So if we select the one we want, I'll just show you how this is uh, configured. It only takes a few minutes to configure it, so you don't need to do it like this, but this um, just saves me time. I do a lot of this sort of work, so uh, I want to be able to um, set the analyzer up very quickly to do uh, testing of different devices. So I select the one I want, in this case, the LS244. We load that configuration. And then if we look at the configuration, and I nearly always use state mode, so this is configured as state mode, and the master clock is the J clock, which is the clock input of pod one. And that's connected to the Z80 clock on the REN board. And then what I have is uh, the pins, or the inputs to the analyzer, configured in a logical way according to the data sheet. So we have uh, four pins for the A inputs, four pins for the A outputs, and then the same thing with the inputs and outputs for the uh, B block, and then we have two more um, inputs for the uh, control pins, so that's the A enable and the B enable. And that is really all the pins we need to be able to analyse this particular device. So what I then do is clip it in turn to each of the uh, 244 devices on the board. So I've got it clipped to one now. I'll turn the REN on. So the REN's now booted up. And what we can do is go to the waveform view. I'll arm the analyzer. And as you can see, we have captured some data. Now, of course, this method of testing relies on the value that the buffer is trying to propagate containing bit values that will demonstrate whether all the bits are faulty or not. What I mean by that is, let's say a bit is tied high, then if that bit um, is supposed to be high by virtue of the input value, then it's not going to show a fault. But if the input goes low and the output stays high, then obviously that's indicative of a fault. So I'll press the arm again, and you can see that um, we've come back past the same point in the code, the same device has been accessed. First time through we had E on the input and E on the output of the B block of buffers, but now we're getting uh, an input value of E and an output value of F. So we'll try that again. And then just to make sure it's not a time issue, that is it's just a slow device, if we scroll across so each of these divisions is one clock cycle, or one half clock cycle, one clock edge of the Z80 clock, because I'm clocking on both the positive and negative edges of the Z80 clock. Uh, we can see that this is not a time issue, it's uh, obviously a fairly hard fault with that device, um, but when the value on the input uh, was E, then the output was showing E as well, but now the output has changed to F uh, when it should still be E. So there's obviously a fault with that particular device. Uh, and then what you can do of course is put uh, a scope on to the device and see uh, what's going on. So uh, obviously uh, the lower bit of the B uh, block is not working the way it's supposed to. And I have this connected um, in a sequential manner with regard to the pins. So what we're looking at here is uh, we need to put a scope onto pin 9 and see what's going on. So I'll move the camera back down so you can see the, um, the scope and we'll see what that particular pin is doing. Okay, so looking at the scope, I've got the scope probe on the output pin of that particular buffer and as you can see it is stuck high. So what I normally do is go around all the similar devices on the board, making sure that uh, they all work and any that don't I mark, and then I swap them all and then retest. 
Um, but because I'm obviously trying to shoot this video, what I'll do is I'll stop the testing here, replace this particular device, and then we'll retest it and see if it's working. There's always a possibility, of course, that it's not the buffer itself that's causing the problem, it's the device that it's connected to. Uh, however, if that's the case, you'd normally see signs of the buffer attempting to switch and also the buffer would tend to start getting very hot and this buffer is not heating up so I suspect it's just the output has failed on it and it's not uh, attempting to switch at all. So I'll get this uh, device swapped out, get back on camera and we'll see if we've made any progress. Okay so I replaced that device, put it in a socket of course and uh, the one that came out is indeed showing uh, as faulty and so I tested it uh, again on the analyzer and it cured that particular issue moved on to the next device on the board and uh, getting a similar result uh, we've got a, a stuck bit on this uh, device as well uh, so going back to the uh, scope to just to double check the bit that seems seems to be stuck is the uh, first buffer in the A block and so that's uh, pin 2 is the input and pin 18 is the output. Pin 1 is tied low, it's actually connected to ground so these are enabled all the time and so if we measure pin 2 and look at that on the scope we can see we're getting a repetitive signal on that particular pin and we, if we look at pin 18 we should be seeing the same thing there and there's nothing there at all so again that's yet another failed buffer and this is what you tend to find will happen you'll get a cascade failure one will fail uh, or the machine will go into a, an undefined state where the firmware isn't running properly multiple devices will be connected to the bus at the same time and then one or more of them will start to fail and then you'll get a cascade failure uh, with more joining in the party so I'll replace this device, test it again and see if we're getting any nearer. OK, so I've replaced this device and we'll put the scope back on, see if we've corrected the issue. So if you recall we were getting a signal going in, which we're still getting, uh, but we were getting nothing coming out. And we are now getting a signal coming out, so uh, that's this uh, problem sorted out. Uh, I've also tried it on the uh, logic analyzer and I'm now getting the correct outputs compared to the inputs. So I'll continue around the rest of the buffers on the board doing the same thing. Uh, I won't video all of them, though I suspect there's an, another three or four that need replacing and uh, once I've got those replaced I'll get back on camera and we'll start looking at the uh, rest of the fault finding process. So I spent a few hours with the analyzer going over the various buffers and latches and found a number of failed uh, devices and I've been working my way through the rest of the board and uh, the approach that I take is I try to get the board fundamentally running. Um, as I've shown on the previous REN videos there is a self test built into this machine and when that test starts running the LEDs on the keyboard uh, give an indication as to which particular part of the self-test has failed. Uh, as you saw this board wasn't running at all so it wasn't getting as far as starting that self-test and there were various reasons. Um, the flute wouldn't run properly on this board either. Uh, I couldn't run proper uh, memory tests this sort of thing because there were just too many failed components. As I said the issue with a board design like this is because of the nature of the devices that were selected for the design. If one fails they tend to take out all the rest. So what I've been looking for using the analyzer and the scope is stuck bits, uh, inputs to a buffer where the output uh, wasn't changing. And um, as I said as I progressed I got to the point where the uh, caps lock LED was coming on um, but nothing else was happening. Uh, as far as the um, LED displays is concerned anyway and uh, that's a sign that it's going into the uh, memory uh, common RAM self-test and then crashing and uh, that's normally uh, something to do with either the buffers and latches down here uh, or there's a, a clock control circuit over here which is uh, 
part of the issue with the board it's a bit of a weird layout so it does tend to cause problems so just to recap on what I've done so far is I replaced um, the Z80 socket the one that was in there wasn't uh, making good contact was causing problems I've replaced the ROMs I've replaced the Z80 itself the original just um, it was kind of working but the uh, data output uh, bus was very weak and it was uh, it would not run at 12 megahertz and I mentioned previously that I've put a socket in for the crystal and that's one of the reasons I do that um, so I could run the machine at uh, 6 megahertz rather than 12 it would work fine um, but as soon as I put the 12 megahertz crystal in um, it stopped fetching instructions from the ROM and that's the sign really of a weak processor could be other things causing it but in this case um, replacing the processor resolved that up to a point uh, I then started looking around for um, failed buffers uh, as I demonstrated the method for using that uh, and I found quite a few I found uh, a latch that is used to control access between the DRAM and the SRAM that had failed um, a couple of buffers so there's a couple of uh, 244s uh, that had failed. Um, just one or two bits on most of them that weren't working uh, and then another buffer up um, by the uh, CPU that had almost totally failed. There's I think four bits um, were stuck uh, and then another uh, couple of um, buffers, one down that uh, controls the DRAM and that was most likely killed when one of the DRAMs failed. Uh, I did replace the DRAMs as I said before I started this uh, video uh, and then uh, another um, buffer chip up here. Uh, this is this one quite often fails, and it's the one that uh, effectively connects the Z80 to the peripheral devices, and um, it gets quite a hard life. And uh, that's one of the first ones to fail in this machine. Uh, and then there were just a couple of uh, glue logic chips uh, that are damaged, most likely due to battery leakage. And again, over here. Uh, on all three boards uh, I've been doing recently uh, there was a number of chip failures in this area um, so once I'd done that I the, got as far as getting the board to start the cell test it got to test 6 and then failed and that's the UART test and the UART itself had failed that's the first time I've had one of these fail I replaced that it then got through to test 9 and failed and that's the real-time clock and uh, this time it was um, another broken track underneath the socket, so I repaired that, got that working. And it would then periodically try to boot up, but then crash halfway through, and it was a, a bit flaky. Putting a 6 MHz crystal back in, it was fine. 12 MHz, it uh, didn't want to know. Uh, and again, that's normally a sign that there's some issue with the... A DRAM or one of the glue logic chips is failing so it can be a bit vague but uh, again breaking out the scope looking at the signals I found that um, the signal out of a couple of the DRAMs uh, was a little bit slow and uh, again it's fairly indicative that the DRAMs I had weren't quite fast enough and there were replacements uh, but there was no speed marking on them so I suspect they're probably 200 or 250 uh, nanosecond which is not really fast enough for this machine so I put 120s in and it will now get a lot further on uh, 12 megahertz, but it still wouldn't go through to the boot up screen. So found another issue over by the video controller. Uh, again, that was a broken track. It's quite, quite strange there being so many broken tracks on this board because the board itself does appear to be in excellent condition, but there's been quite a few um, broken tracks on this. So that's a little bit strange. I want to say broken, what I mean is um, they were uh, broken where the wires go through the board and although most of them uh, have been soldered right the way through, some are not soldered and those uh, weren't all making good contact through the board. So tracking that down, uh, I've tested the board, buzzed out the final ones that weren't working and so I want to see now if it will uh, actually get any further through the boot up. As I say, it was getting to uh, the self-test and getting most of the way through the self-test, but then uh, it didn't make it all the way through. I'll just pull the keyboard up so we can see the LEDs. And what we're looking for is the 
uh, caps lock LED to uh, come on during the self-test uh, and then we've got an LED down here I'm not quite sure if you can see that and uh, that uh, LED next to the ribbon cable um, will flash any error codes that uh, come up okay hopefully you can uh, see that now so what should happen is the caps lock LED should come on while it's running the cell test and then any error codes are indicated by the power LED flashing and it flashes a number of times depending on the uh, self test that's failed okay so we'll power it up and see how far we get through this time and you see it's failed on the common RAM we'll press reset okay so we've still got a bit of oh, okay so we've got the welcome screen coming up uh, as we saw it didn't power up uh, straight to the welcome screen I had to press reset a couple of times so it looks like we've still got um, a glue chip somewhere or one of the buffers is still a bit weak so I'll look into that and try and track that down have now of course got a lot further with this machine we started with a completely dead board uh, I've gone through uh, quite a handful of um, components that have failed let's grab them so you can have a another quick look so as you can see it's quite a handful for this particular board uh, but we have got a lot further now now it would be nice at this point to plug the uh, floppy drives in and see if we can actually boot to um, the operating system uh, unfortunately I know that the floppy drive controller is not working and although it will calibrate it will not read any data it won't slice any data coming from the floppy drive so I do have some on order and as soon as they come in then I'll get one fitted, calibrate it, I'll connect the drives and then in the next video we'll see if we can actually get this third machine to boot to the operating system.